see the, the Aussies are a sturdy folk. Yeah. It's kind of what, and you're still here. My goodness. I have to show up, you know. But, uh, you can bail out any time you like. So I don't know that I've actually mentioned this before, but I have been leading retreats, teaching since 1976. My Lama, somebody asked me to teach, lead a retreat. And I, I was thinking, no way, I've only been practicing for six years. But I sp spoke with my, the abbot of a monastery who had ordained me as a novice, Geshe Rapun. I said, these people asked me to teach, but I'm not, I'm not prepared, I'm not ready. But I thought I'd consult with you. And he said, you're teaching. And that was the end of that conversation. That's how I began teaching. But I've been teaching now, leading retreats, lecturing, all that jazz for 43 years. And this is the first time in all of that time that I've actually ever co-led a retreat. I've always felt, I know the material, I can teach it. And I do, the I do know, I still I don't know, I haven't forgotten anything, I do know the material. But um, I just felt this time I think it could be even more beneficial to have a co-teacher who I respect, trust, admire. Um, but this is with trial and error, you know, I've never done this before. Very happy to. I, when I was il at the university, teaching at university, sometimes I would, I would co-teach classes with a professor and I was a, le a lecturer. We were, it was really co-taught. One had a higher rank, full professor, I was a lecturer. That, that I've done, but leading a retreat not. So all of this is to say that uh, we're doing trial and error here. And my sense is that I believe some of you are driving from a bit of a different a distance. There's not obviously not a residential retreat. And I would like for you not to feel exhausted at the end of the day. I would like, it happens once in a while, okay, but I'd like not not be something that becomes a habit. Oh, wow, this is really long. So that in mind, and the heat and the smoke, uh, I, would, I, I have suggested uh, that we shift the schedule a little bit. Um, and so the session, and I've, I've made this decision, an executive decision, uh, that my se the session right now will be for an hour and a half. We're starting at 1.30, we'll end at 3. This will give us the 24-minute the session. One hour of me teaching, I think that's enough for anybody. Beyond that, could be start to be cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> so I think an hour and a half total we do it. And when I'm leading retreats, it's usually three hours, three hours, and then question and answer at the end. The three hours is always broken up, and I never talk for an hour for 90 minutes at a time in a retreat. For a lecture, yeah, I'll do that. So that's what we'll do. Like it or lump it. And then we'll break at three o'clock, three twenty, come back, and everything will be moved up by half an hour. And hopefully at the end of, of the session with, with Yang Shen, you'll feel, well, that was a really full meal, but you're not exhausted, you're not mm, feeling mental constipation or anything else that would be disagreeable. And fresh and ready for a pleasant drive home or wherever you're going to. So that's the plan. And we can always change it, but I thought that might be good, especially today. It's probably the hottest day for this whole retreat. So that said, I'd like to spend one more session on this method, which is very useful. And I'll mention this, I mentioned earlier for the infirmary and especially in, in the supine position, the asanga method generally, really good because it's so grounding and it's not tightly focusing the attention on anything. We're tending to a whole field, right, and the fluctuations within that field. So very good in terms of relaxation, stability, and vividness is the third quality we'll be cultivating in sequence. The asanga method, especially supine, is really, really good for relaxation and for stability. Generally speaking, sitting up is very, very good for clarity. And so even if you, have, if you have a day, like you make a Buddhist Sabbath, and you have maybe six hours to meditate in a day, then you can alternate between sitting, lying down, sitting, lying down. And then every time you're lying down, good emphasis laying the foundation in relaxation and stability. Every time you're sitting up, more of the cutting edge of vividness. So that said, um, there was a point to make there. I've already lost it. Maybe I'm getting tired. No, I'm just getting old. <laughs> so, we're going to go back to this Burmese technique. Yeah, that'll be it. That'll be enough for now. There are more, more to come. I don't think we need any more. Oh, yes, there it was. There it was. When, we're out, when this retreat's over, I mentioned before, on those days, hopefully it's not too frequent, but on those days when you're just upset, just upset, you, we all know what that means. Then the infirmary, Asanga method, especially lying down, that's the cat's meow. Just really will really be helpful. To just diffuse, diffuse, release, release, relax, relax, relax. 
really good. But then you may very well encounter other days where you're not upset, emotionally not upset about anything. It's just the mind is really agitated, rambunctious, blah, 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 scattered, agitated, and so forth, but not emotionally upset. It's different, yeah? You know the difference, yeah? So on those days where you're not stressed out, you're not upset, it's just the mind, it's just a chatterbox. Very hard to fall asleep that way. And the mind just won't stop talking. And you tell it, you know, like your dog trying to train your mind, saying, mind, please be quiet. And the mind says, no, you be quiet. <laughs> Hard, and then you're having this argument with your mind. I said it first, doesn't matter, I'm bigger. <laughs> okay, so on those occasions when you feel just agitation but not really upset, this method is really good. This method is for grounding, it's for stability. It calms the mind, and you're releasing thought, releasing thought, and it's a bit, and, and you are cultivating continuity, cultivating stability. It's not just relaxation without losing clarity. You're now setting out. You've got your backpack on, you have your hiking boots on, and you're heading, heading out on the path of shamatha. This means the core of shamatha is if you don't have a sense of stillness, you're not, you're not achieving shamatha at all. Shamatha means calm stillness, right? And so really that stability is the core of shamatha. The relaxation is to enable it. The vividness is to give it icing on the cake to make sure you're not just stable but dull, right? But if you don't have stability, then you've missed the whole point. You've missed the core of shamatha. So on those occasions when you're just the mind is quite agitated, then number one, we know from the Buddha, he said, oh, when that happens, mindfulness of breathing is the recommended uh, meditation, only one consonant off of medication, you know? Um, and so very good for that. And in the supine positions, fine. Mindfulness of breathing, rise and fall of the supine, that's, um, and Bob's your uncle. Yeah. I'm, not in UK, I'm, I'm not in England, it seems. And Bob's your uncle. In other words, that'll do it. It's good. So that would be what I would say for this. It is stability without losing relaxation. And on those days when the mind is quite agitated, this can be really just what you need. To just calm the waves, calm the waves. At the same time, developing stability. So without further ado, please find a comfortable position. We'll have one more session, under my guidance, of this Burmese method. In terms of the attitude that you bring with you to the meditation, as much as possible, I would encourage you to bring the attitude of, an, of I'm going to practice this because this is what I love to do. I find it meaningful. I find it beneficial. This is my gift to myself to bring greater sense of well-being to my life and thereby to be a better person for everybody around me. So your meditation is an act of benevolence, directly for yourself, indirectly, for everyone else. With such a motivation, then, settling your body in its natural state, relaxed, still, and vigilant. And in order to 
settle the inner speech or the inner voice of your mind in its natural state of effortless stillness. We settle the respiration in its natural rhythm. And in order to do that, we ease the movements of the respiration. It's very easy to be giving effort to breathing. But the healthiest breathing you'll do in a 24-hour period is almost certainly the restorative, revitalizing breathing that takes place when you're in deep dreaming sleep and you're totally out of the way and your body is breathing without your interference. So breathe as if you were deep asleep. ease the movements of the breath as you relax more and more deeply with every out breath. Set your mind at ease, allowing yourself free time to do with what you wish, releasing the past and the future, and resting non-conceptually in the present moment. With your awareness at ease, still and clear, allowing your mind to settle in its natural state much as you allow your breathing to settle in its natural rhythm. The two are in fact conjoined. as we venture into the main practice for this session. If you're sitting up, see that you're sitting at attention. It's a subtle point, but it does, does entail, of course, keeping your spine quite straight. But it's that subtle elevation of your sternum, like a soldier standing at attention. Just subtle, a half an inch. And then leaving your belly be loose and relaxed. Soldiers probably don't do that. Your belly is soft, jelly belly. But with that slight elevation, then when the breath flow flows in, the air, of course, is going to your lungs, but the sensations of the breath flow right down to your belly without it being constrained or constricted in any way because of your posture. And as you breathe in, the belly expands. And let's begin practicing awareness of the rise and fall of the atoms continuous flow of mindfulness of the continuous flow of sensations.
experiment to see whether you find it helpful to introduce the oscillation of arousing, focusing the attention as you breathe in and relaxing your body and mind as you breathe out, all the while maintaining, to the best of your ability, a continuous flow of mindfulness, of the continuous flow of sensations of the rise and fall of your abdomen. See if it's helpful. With the arousal of what's happening or preventing dullness and the release overcoming the imbalance of excitation. Are skills to be developed. They won't come easily, but they'll be of inestimable value. And so far as you do develop them, the one we've covered well, that is mindfulness. Your ability to bear in mind, without distraction, without forgetfulness, that which you wish to attend to, in this case, the sensations of breathing. But you need a quality control. It needs to be monitored, so that when you do drift away or drift off, either into mind-wandering or dullness. You need to recognize that, to proceed along this path, and the faculty by which you recognize that we call introspection. It is expecting inquiry, looking within on the flow of mindfulness. This faculty needs to be used, and it will be honed and refined like sharpening a knife, so that you quickly detect when your mind has strayed quickly detect when you're losing interest, becoming bored and becoming dull. So in your own experience now, identify the referent of this word introspection. Can you see it in your own experience? This is introspection and this is mindfulness. That's what these words are for, to point to our own experience and help us refine these faculties. The benefits are tremendous.
retrospective you detect that you have been caught up in rumination, carried away, you're no longer meditating. You're just sitting there with a the wandering mind. As soon as you recognize it, without being upset or judgmental or disapproving of yourself, rather than tightening up, whipping your mind into shape, as soon as you see your mind has wandered, loosen up, relax. Relax, release your identification with that thought. It will disappear of its own accord as soon as you do that. back where you wanted to be. So just relax, patiently and persistently. Every time you see your mind has wandered, release the grasping, the identification with whatever captured your attention. You see you're slacking off, losing interest, not giving it your best shot anymore, becoming complacent and dull. As soon as you see you're losing the clarity or have lost some degree of clarity of attention, freshen up, reboot, focus, arouse, and thereby restore the flow of clear, cognizant Particularly this method of mindfulness of breathing is especially helpful for strengthening the stability, the continuity of attention, without losing the underlying sense of relaxation, to facilitate this continuity, this continuous flow of mindfulness. There are multiple traditions of the Buddha Dharma, within Zen, Theravada, Mahayana, Indian Buddhism, even Rajayana Buddhism, and how it felt helpful to count the breath. They're like speed bumps on a road. They bring you back. And so I invite you now to experiment, each one of us individually, drawing our own conclusion about the extent to which this method, this auxiliary method, is helpful. There are various ways of counting the breath. Here's one. Continuing to allow the breath to flow effortlessly, settling in its natural rhythm. When the in-breath flows in effortlessly without being pulled or obstructed. And you come to the very end of inhalation, just at that turnaround point be before exhalation begins. Mentally, succinctly count one. A staccato count. Then, non-conceptually, relax, release as you breathe out, while maintaining mindfulness of the sensations, all the way to the end, quietly, releasing any thoughts that come up. The next breath flows in like a wave, washing your attention, till you come to the very end of the next inhalation, two, staccato count. And in between these counts, at the very end of inhalation, 
that your mind be as silent as possible while maintaining that clear cognizance of the relative dura duration, long or short, of each in and out breath. One count at the end of each inhalation, counting one through ten. If you lose count, go back to one. Let's try it. Let's try ten breaths. soon conclude this session, but as you practice it in again in the future, experiment to see whether the Kaiju is in fact helpful or whether it more clutters the mind. So try counting 10 breaths, 10 breaths, one cycle after another through a session and see, does this help you enhance the stability of your attention without losing relaxation? Or is it just more cluttering the mind? Is it helpful? occasionally count 10 breaths and then just go back to the practice without thought? Or do you find it just not helpful at all? Any of those three is fine, but you need to know for yourself. The point is to enhance the stability of your attention without losing relaxation. That's the criterion. So let's continue practicing now.
sure you remember that quite lovely metaphor the Buddha gave of the cloudburst on a day like this. Wouldn't it be wonderful? There's a great big cloudburst all over New South Wales, and it can, can quell on the spot not only the smoke in the air, but the fires that cause it. So that's what we wish for, aspire for, we can pray for that. Um, but those three qualities, engaging in this practice, in your cultivation of samadhi by way of mindfulness of breathing, you'll experience a state that is peaceful, sublime, and ambrosial dwelling. It just occurred to me, coming out of that session, that there's probably a loose correlation between that triad and another triad. Insofar as you cultivate relaxation, especially without losing clarity, that's peaceful. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Peaceful. But then as you get into flow, you know the term, right? From Csikszentmihalyi, the psychologist, University of Chicago, I believe. We all know what it is. Yeah, that just flow, like the marathon runner on the second wind. Flow in music, flow in athletics, flow in various ways, where you're just streaming, you're flowing, you're, you're in the groove. Music happens a lot. That's what happens when you are really developing the stability, that continuity. You're just streaming. You know? and, you, and when you're not streaming, then Gently, your introspection nudges you back, nudges you back. So you're streaming right down. Like in a toboggan run, like the Olympics, we've all seen that, right? Where the sled just zips down, but what they don't want to do is be bumping on the sides a lot. So they're just right in the center, and if they're really guiding it well, slick as a whistle right down that ramp, and like that. Hmm, like that. So you try to not bump into laxity and excitation, and just stream, flow right through. So when you're in really experiencing that flow of stability, the flow of continuity, there's a real sense of well-being there. When your mind is agitated, let alone upset, but when it's just agitated, you just can't calm down, you can't sleep, you can't get the mind, please, calm down. That's just not a sense of well-being, that's a sense of being ill at ease, because it's just not pleasant. But when it calms down, and yet you're not sleepy, you're not losing your clarity, sense of well-being there. Like, this is a mind I really wouldn't mind having as a next-door neighbor. You know? But then when you go into clarity, and we haven't quite gotten there yet, I've not emphasized it, but the third balance is enhancing clarity without losing stability. Now, that's really the cherry on the cake. That's the culmination. This is a pyramid here. It's relaxation, stability, and then up at the top of the pyramid is the vividness, the acuity, the sharpness, the clarity, luminosity, brightness, the intense wakefulness, and when you experience that supported by stability, which makes the clarity sustainable, and the stability is supported by relaxation, which makes the stability sustainable, that's where you're going to find bliss. That's where you're going to find you really enjoy the practice. That's just an ordinary way of saying it. But you really enjoy it. If you say, if, if somebody could just poke in right while you're in, in that flow of relaxed, stable, and clear, you're just, just sharp, clear, fresh, 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 fresh. And somebody said, would I take a break and have a, an ice cream soda? Or whatever people eat nowadays? I think my grandparents had ice cream soda. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't okay, any, okay, something you really like. Ice cream, that'll do it. Would you like to, would you like to take an ice cream break? And the answer would be, Shh. no thanks. I'm already enjoying myself. 1988, we had a ret one year retreat that I organized, but the man who led it, was a very experienced Tibetan yogi named Genlam Rimba. At the end of the year, one, one of the 12 people in the retreat was practicing mindfulness of breathing under his guidance. He was the, he was, I, was his assist, I was his apprentice in that. I had the wherewithal to organize it, but I really wanted to invite a, an expert to lead the retreat. He did a superb job. This one woman practicing mindfulness of breathing for a year. At the end of the year, every, everybody had started with 18 sessions per day, 18 sessions, 15 minutes, 15 minutes apiece, four and a half hours, it's not a lot. But Genlam Rimba said, keep your sessions short so they don't drag on, you don't get bored, you don't get sloppy and complacent. 15 minutes, take a break. 15 minutes, do it 18 times. Everybody did that. But then the idea, and this is very well known in the Tibetan tradition, as you advance in the practice, the mind is calming down, it's getting more composed, getting more clear, then you increase the duration and decrease the numbers. That's just classic really sound. The, the amount of experience behind the words that I'm sharing with you is almost inconceivable. I'm just one guy. I've been practicing 49 years. Big deal. It's over. But 
this is centuries. I mean, it's really quite something. So this one woman at the end, end of the year, then she, was, she went from 18 sessions to two sessions. The first one was 11 hours. The second one was four hours. Continuous. And I asked her, why did you meditate that long? And she said, well, I was enjoying it so much, I didn't want to take a break. Then, I'm being a rather obnoxious person, my, my friends know that, mm, kind of pushy. I said, well, then, why did you take a break? <laughs> I'm not going to give her a break, you know, it's just long, I'm going to say, why long, but short, well, you know, but why did you take a break? She said, I needed to pee <laughs> and get a bite to eat. But then she still had some petrol in her tank, so then she went back for another four hours. There was no sense I should be doing this or I'm so proud that Alan will talk about me or whatever, nothing of that. She was practicing what she loved and the practice she gave her, gave her joy. And it's mindfulness of breathing. So, that's encouraging. encouraging. But that's what everybody here can do if we take the time, devote ourselves to it. So that's that. So there we are. Ah, yes, but that relationship. I know this to be the case. One more point. Yeah, there was one more point. And that is sometimes the most apparently entertaining things, like a really great movie or beautiful music or a fantastic meal, have you not found on occasion that something objectively is just really great, entertaining, tasty, fun, is just not? Everybody else enjoying the movie and you're just finding it bored. Other people really enjoying the meal and you're just kind of chewing away and so forth. Yeah? So objectively, reality is really dishing it up. Hey, have some hedonia, have some hedonia. And you're saying, well, I can tell you why. That your enjoyment, your interest in whatever you're attending to is not determined, determined objectively. It's determined subjectively. I, I actually know this to be true. And so whatever act we're engaging in, whether it's mindfulness of breathing or watching a movie or sailing or bicycling or answering your email, what I have found to be the case is the greater the clarity there is, the more interesting that phenomenon will be. Not necessarily enjoyable, but interesting. Mindfulness of breathing, the breathing, the sensations of the breath, can be interesting for 12 hours, or in her case, 11 hours at a stretch. It can be interesting, not because anything happened that somehow the breathing rhythm got so fascinating you say, wow, how is this going to turn out? It's not objectively interesting. It never gets objectively interesting. It gets subtler and subtler and subtler. That's what happens. That's not interesting. That's just subtler. But she was enjoying this because of the clarity that was coming in. It was a sustainable clarity. She was a smart, well-informed, well-guided practitioner. So she was maintaining, of course, ease, otherwise you'd get burnt out. Stability, that's the continuity. But the clarity was there, and the, the joy, the pleasure, the enjoyment of the practice is coming out of clarity. That's the direct correlation. So if you're listening to a person who's just speaking in objectively a very boring way, that happens on occasion, yeah? I'm not the only one that's noticed that. Please don't raise your hand right now. <laughs> By the way, Alan, you do go on a bit, you know. <laughs> um, that you may be attending to somebody who's just not saying anything really interesting. Their words are not interesting. That's, that's, you know, you wouldn't tell them that probably. You're polite. But if you're attending to that person with a great deal of interest, if you're really focusing, and you're listening to them, you're seeing body language, you're attending to the facial expression, You'll find it interesting. You'll find the person interesting, even if not the words. Where you could be engaging with one of the most fascinating characters you've ever met in your life, and if you don't bring the quality of clarity to it, it's not the, it won't be interesting. So whether something is interesting or not, whether it's engaging or not, is not objectively determined. It's directly correlated. In my experience, I can say I know this is true. It's directly correlated with the degree of clarity I bring to that task. So mindfully breathing in and out, it can be utterly interesting. No two breaths are the same. You never get a repeat performance. Generally, yes, of course. But like in ballet, I would I'm, I'm assume no single performance is just like the preceding one. Then you just play a video. Playing music, never the same. Playing a tennis, a tennis match, never the same. 
European football or soccer? As an American, I'm not so sure. <laughs> but that's because I don't appreciate the game. I just don't know why they don't use their hands. <laughs> I mean, what are these for? Do you think they're, do you, are, are you a penguin? You just haven't learned how to use them yet? <laughs> no, okay. No, that's one I don't understand. So I, I find, you've seen one soccer match, you've seen them all. Bong, bong, bong. After 90 minutes, no, no. Wow, that was fun. <laughs> Done, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> but maybe a correlation. Relaxation, peace, stability, well-being, vividness, joy. I think that maybe that's not trivial. So let's go on now. The feedback nature of mindfulness of breathing. This is significant. It's a simple point. But it's unique. The Hindus have methods for developing attention. The Christians, no doubt about it. The Sufis, the Taoists. I said Hindus, of course they do. They invented it. Um, but among all the wide range of practices designed to help you develop mindfulness, introspection, samadhi, mindfulness of breathing is unique in the sense that in other practices, such as for those of you trained in, in Tibetan Buddhism, if you learn shamatha from any geshe or kempo Tibetan teacher, that person would quite likely teach you, here's a method, it's a classic, it's great, Tsongkhapa emphasizes it, now gen find an, an image of the Buddha, focus on it clearly, and now generate a facsimile of that image in your mind's eye, visualize the Buddha, and focus on that, that's your object of mindfulness. So with the, with the rope of mindfulness, attach your attention to that object, with the hook of introspection, then keep focusing on that and develop stability and clarity and you're focusing on a mental image. And as you progress on that path, it's certainly a perfectly good practice, um, as, you pr as you focus on it, it will become clearer and clearer and clearer, higher resolution, higher definition, until when you achieve shamatha, that visualized image, which is extremely vague and fleeting at the beginning, will come so clearly in your mind's eye, it's as if you're seeing it with your, with your eyes. Yogis who have gone that far on that path, it becomes utterly vivid, three-dimensional, translucent, rated, Radiant, and you can hold it for four hours at a stretch when you achieve shamatha. So it becomes clearer, 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 right? And that's generally true. If you're developing relaxation, stability, and vividness, what you're attending to just looms clearer and clearer and clearer, high resolution. With mindfulness of breathing, and we'll get, to, and it's true for all the practices, but especially the one we'll go to, to tomorrow, which is the classic interpretation of mindfulness of breathing in the Theravada tradition, focusing on the cessations at the apertures of the nostrils right here above the upper lip. Especially, it's obvious there. We'll do, we'll do that through that tomorrow morning. And that is there. It's most evident there that as you're settling in and the whole system is calming down, as the Buddha said, calming the composite of the body I breathe in, calming the composite of the body I breathe out. The whole system is calming down, which means you're burning less calories. The mind is less active. The body is pretty much inactive. And so the whole system is calming down. And as the whole system calms down, emotions calm down, agitation of mind calms down, then your body doesn't need as much oxygen. If you get really excited, upset, emotional, you need more oxygen. You're, you're doing exercise, you need more oxygen. Well, now you're not, not neither of the above. And so as you're going deeper and deeper, more and more deeply calming the composite of the body with its prana system, your body will need less and less air, which means your breath will become shallower and shallower. Which means the sensations, especially here, right around the nostrils, will become subtler and subtler and subtler. Which gives you, I'm, I'm giving you a sneak preview of tomorrow morning, as the sensations become subtler and subtler, one of two things will happen. Your mindfulness with which you're engaging with those increasingly subtle uh, sensations of the respiration will correspondingly become more subtle, which means you will be sharpening the knife of the vividness, clarity, acuity of your attention. You will be enhancing vividness, hopefully without sacrificing stability. And that increasingly subtle flow of sensation with the breath, it will keep on getting subtler. It's like getting a whetstone with a finer and finer grain. And so the breath is helping you develop increasingly subtle. Where people looking at somebody sees you from outside, and you're sitting there like a stone Buddha, and they come over to Tony, Tony's in deep in Samadhi. 
He might be dead. Can you bring a doctor? Because I can't see whether he's breathing or not. An outside person may not be able to detect. They can't, they can't see it. They might bring a mirror right, oh, yeah, there's a little bit of mist there. Tony would know if he's going deep into Samadhi because his awareness is so acute, so fine, that he's picking up the subtlest sensations there, passing in and out. But now, if one, I won't pick on Tony anymore, but if, then it's getting subtler, subtler, and actually, after a while, the sensations of the breath get subtler than your awareness is. Then you lose it. And then if you lose it, and you're not aware that you lost it, then you'll drift off. You'll probably go into, into rumination. I've lost track of it. Well, okay, here's the thought. Blah, 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 and off you go. And then that thought can easily bump into an emotion or trigger an emotion, and that will trigger a desire. And lo and behold, now your mind is active, and lo and behold, your body needs more oxygen. And more air will come in, and the sensations will get stronger. Right? Because you're just sitting there with a mind, mind wandering. You can go huff and puff in mind wandering. All kinds of emotions come, come up. And so it comes back and fetches you. The sensations get coarser. You say, you lost me, but here I am. <laughs> you know, are you getting me yet? I'm here. Hello. Calling you from afar. Until you pick up, oh yeah, breathing. Got it, got it, got it. I remember. Yep. And then you go back down. So it re it's a feedback. If you go off wandering, the sensation will become coarser. If you stay in the groove, they will take you on a long ride. And I'll tell you where it ends. You don't have to believe what I'm saying because it's never been tested scientifically, but it's been tested for maybe three or 4,000 years in terms of first-person experience. The Hindus know this. The Buddhists know, have known this for millennia. And that is you, if you go really into very, very deep samadhi, and look out for counterfeit claims because they're all over the place. I'm sorry to say, but a, a lot of the accounts of people claiming I've achieved the first, second, third, fourth jhana, a lot, they don't know what they're talking about. They should, but they don't. And I don't think they're trying to delude anybody, but they've deluded themselves. Because if you achieve the fourth jhana, and we'll see, it's not my notes, he says, it's so obvious it shouldn't have to be stated. If you achieve the fourth jhana, shamatha is right next to, it's on the cusp on the threshold of the first jhana. Pali is jhana, Sanskrit jhana, almost the same. But you achieve shamatha, which is the theme of this, of this retreat, you've achieved the threshold of the first jhana. You can go into samadhi, remain there for four hours, no problem, effortlessly. And your senses have completely imploded. This is the gold standard. Not, not my opinion. This is gold standard. Theravada, Mahayana, it doesn't matter. This is the gold standard. You've achieved shamatha, access to the first jhana, four hours, easy peasy, effortless, totally imploded, crystal clear, sharp, radiant, luminous, blissful, and non-conceptual. You've achieved shamatha, great. But you have to go beyond that to fully, uh, fully achieve the first jhana. Beyond that, the second, the third, and the fourth. If you achieve the fourth jhana, it is universally stated in all schools of Buddhism that if you achieve the fourth jhana, your breathing stops. It, it's not, it, it not stops. Nothing going in, nothing going out. And you can remain in samadhi for hours and hours, perhaps even days. Now that's just the gold standard. That's not an opinion. Anybody who can read English translations is right there. In the Buddhist teachings, in Theravada teachings, in Mayana teachings, it's there. So anybody claims, I've achieved the fourth jhana, say, good, let's, let's see. Let's see. Let's see how you can do that. How about going for eight hours? I want to see you do that for eight hours with no breathing. It'll be very impressive. I'll give you a big hug if you can succeed. If you don't, stop saying that. You're deluding everybody. And there's a lot of it, I'm sorry to say. People wanting to believe and then believing and then just blinking whenever they see something in the most authoritative treatise we have, blinking. Like, oh, he didn't really mean that. I've heard people do this fancy footwork, wanting to claim high things, and then when show them, but right there, then they do some fancy footwork. So that's what happens. You go along that dhyana trajectory and your, the volume of your breath gets subtler, 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 and then goes down. And this should be studied scientifically. Maybe we'll do this one day in, in our center that we're creating in Tuscany. I believe it just because it's common knowledge for like 3,000 years in Hinduism and Buddhism. And so but why not study that scientifically? Because how can you not breathe for hours on end and not come out with brain damage? If you did, people wouldn't do it again. 
they find, oh, he tried it, he's brain dead, let's not do that. You know, they're smart, they wouldn't do that. So no brain damage, how is that possible? They could not breathe for hours on end and you come out bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, perfectly clear, no damage. Well, that would be very interesting to say, study scientifically, but it's common knowledge throughout Hinduism, throughout Buddhism. So that's where it goes, all of this, to say we're not going to be going that far in this week. But that's trajectory. But then when your mind becomes agitated, the sensation become coarse, they come and pick you up again, and so there it is, it's a feedback loop, and no other method has that. It's very sweet. And it's free, too, that feedback loop. If that were technology, that would be very pricey. But this is all natural. So that's very cool, very user-friendly, is what I'm saying. So now we have 35 minutes. Let's now really cover from the most definitive gold standard sources that have nothing to do with me. And everybody who knows Buddhism knows these are gold standard sources. It's not a matter of opinion. And so first of all, we're going to now look at mindfulness and introspection. The term sati in, in, in uh, Pali or smriti in Sanskrit, etc. I know quite a number of languages in that regard. Uh, quite universally translated as mindfulness. And it's a very good translation if we really go back to the actual meaning of mindfulness in English, which is not just being aware or being attentive, it is bearing in mind. Mind your manners, mind what I say, mind your head, and so forth and so on. And so that's exactly what sati means. It does primarily, overwhelmingly mean recollection. It has nothing to do with just necessarily being moment to moment. It has nothing whatsoever to do with being non-judgmental. So this moment to moment awareness in a non-judgmental way is a perfectly good definition. It's very useful, and it's about 50 years old. And in those 50 years, it's proven very useful, and that's fine. It's the correct definition in the modern mindfulness definition and modern mindfulness movement. It's great, no criticism. But they're misleading people when they say this is the Buddhist definition because it never has been, not in any school. In all languages of Asia that have adopted Buddhism, the word they translate, that we translate as mindfulness, has overwhelming, I know, I checked this out, it always has a primary connotation of recollection. It has nothing to do with being non-judgmental, that's great, but it's also nice to be generous, but that's not part of the definition of mindfulness. And mindfulness is not always present-centered, it's recollection. So, what does the Buddha say? If you want to know the Buddhist definition of mindfulness, you might want to just check out the man. Buddha himself. And here it is, Pali Canon, verbatim. And what monk is the faculty of mindfulness? Here, monks, the noble disciple has mindfulness. He is endowed with perfect mindfulness and introspection. He is one who remembers, who recollects what was done and said long before. Now, you can define mindfulness any way you like, but if you say it's a Buddhist definition, it can't be at variance with what the Buddha said. And they do that, and that's false advertising. I wish they wouldn't do that. It's misleading. And so, He's saying mindfulness is recalling, remembering something in the past. Well, let's take mindfulness of breathing. We're introducing that. I gave instructions, right? About settling body, speech, and mind, and you're focusing your whole body or the abdomen and so forth. And then there's introspection and there's mindfulness and what to do and, and there's laxity and excitation. So there's a fair amount of teaching there, instruction, what to do when you're practicing. But if you don't remember that when you're practicing, then you're not practicing anything at all, right? And so when you're practicing mindfully breathing in, mindfully breathing out, if you're not remembering from the past what the instructions were, you're not doing the practice. Maybe you're breathing. That's fine, that's good. But you have to remember the method. Otherwise, you can't do the practice. So you can't just be in the moment. You have to remember, what do I do in the moment? And that's what all that instruction was about. Right? So that's one type of mindfulness. It's a retrospective mindfulness. It's recalling something that was said or done or happened in the past. That's mindfulness. Children, I want, here's, we have guests coming at 8 o'clock, and here's how you, I want you to behave courteously when they come. When they come, I want you to stand them. I want you to greet them politely. And if they ask questions, perfectly respond if you'd like to engage with them. But treat them with respect, with courtesy. This is part of growing up in this world and being a gentleman or a lady. Remember these kids, they're coming at 8 o'clock. Eight o'clock comes, do the children remember what you said or no? That's minding their manners. They actually remember what you said and they're implementing it with the guests come. That's mindfulness. And that's sati. Exactly that. And that's practicing mindfulness breathing because you remember what the instructions were. But that's not all there is to mindfulness. And the Buddha didn't say that's all there is to mindfulness, but he's saying this is the first thing I want to tell you. It's recalling things that took place in the past. It's remembering them. But then when you're practicing mindfulness of breathing, you're not remembering past breaths. Of course. 
You're mindfully engaged with the whole course of the in-breath, the whole course of the out-breath, without forgetfulness, without distraction. That's present-centered mindfulness that in the present moment you are bearing in mind that which you decided to focus on. There's present-centered mindfulness. Okay? But then, let's imagine right now you're practicing and the mind is quite, quite stable, engaged, and clear. But after a while, if you're a relative beginner, after a while it won't be. Sooner or later, you're going to fall into either excitation or, or dullness. That's why we continue practicing. But right now, you're not. Right now, you're just in the flow. You're right, right in the groove there. No real problem of excitation or laxity. But do you have prospective memory? That right now, the flow of mindfulness is perfectly good. But in the future, there will probably come a time when I retrospectively notice that my mind has become distracted in the future, not right now, but in the future it's going to happen. And in the future it could very easily happen, I get bored and dull, listless. So what will I do then if I introspectively note, which I'm not right now because it's not happening, but in the future if I inter introspectively, retrospectively note, my mind becomes either distracted or dull, what, what, what will I do then? Oh, I remember. If I see that I become distracted, I should loosen up. If I see that I'm going to be vague and dull, I should arouse and refresh. Prospective memory. Remembering to do something in the future. So, but all of these have the connotation of bear in mind. Bear in mind. Don't forget. Don't get distracted. So, that's mindfulness. This is the Buddhist definition of mindfulness, and there's very little variation. I checked this out because I've heard so much false propaganda of saying this is the the that moment to moment not judgmental, this is Buddhist definition. There just isn't any tradition of the Buddhist tradition that agrees with that. It's just not true. They just use this for marketing purposes. That's not legitimate. You have good feel. Why call it Buddhist? It's not Buddhist. That's your definition. Good. Go for it. Knock yourself out. This is the Buddhist definition. So it has these variations on it. That's Buddhist definition of mindfulness. And the other one is a very useful one, but it's not is not, will not be, and has not been ever the Buddhist definition of mindfulness. This is gold standard. But now we have not only the Buddha, there have been so many great adepts since him who speak with tremendous authority. One of them is Nagasena. He was an arhat, came to the culmination of the path. According to the path in the Pali Canon, the path to your own liberation, very famous, tremendous authority. This is Melinda Panya, his dialogue with the King Melinda. Renowned, it was the first East-West dialogue, because Melinda was Greek. Greek governor left over from Alexander the Great's invasion of India. So they had a famous dialogue. It's really very interesting. You might want to check it out. With King Melinda, or in, in Greek, his name was Menander. Menander. So the king, Menander, asked this Buddhist sage, what's mindfulness? You, you people talk about mindfulness. What is mindfulness? Good question, right? He's Greek. He doesn't know Pali. And so Nagasena answered him. And he said, mindfulness, when it arises, it calls to mind or it notices, it detects, discerns wholesome and unwholesome tendencies with faults and faultless, inferior and refined, dark and pure, together with their counterparts. Tendencies, these are primarily tendencies of the mind, that here's some resentment coming up, here's some jealous coming up, jealousy coming up, here's quiet coming up, here's compassion coming up, here's and recognizing, not being judgmental, because we know, if you say, oh, you're being very judgmental, we know that's pejorative. It's arrogant, it's condescending, it's unpleasant, it's a vice. No question about that. But you can be non-judgmental and highly discerning. And that's not being judgmental, that's being smart. Okay? And so recognizing, like a nutritionist, recognizes healthy food, healthy food, not healthy food, catastrophically unhealthy food, healthy, extremely healthy food, that's not being judgmental of food, that's being smart and recognizing this food is beneficial, this food is unbeneficial. That's the Buddhist way. I asked John Kabat-Zinn, who's an old friend of mine since 1990, he's a good man. I asked him, what do you, John, what do you, because you, you really, you, def you made this definition. It's your baby. Inspired by Zen in America, inspired by the Pasadena tradition in America. Uh, but what do you mean when you say non-judgmental? And he said, oh, when I say non-judgmental, I mean that whatever you're attending to, you're fully present with it, and you're not slapping onto it, I like, I don't like. That's good. That's good. That's being non-judgmental. That's good. 
But I've seen this over, I've seen this, I've seen people throwing a baby out with the bathwater. That whatever comes up, just embrace it. Embrace it, whatever. There's, I heard one say, there's no such thing as good and evil in Buddhism. Whatever comes up, just embrace it. Don't be judgmental. Just whatever comes up, anger, contempt, violence, abuse, racism, generosity, sweetness, mm, malevolence, you know, don't be judgmental. Just embrace it all. Thank you, malevolence. We can be friends. All that rubbish. That's nonsense. It's, it's, that's, a, that's a method to make yourself stupid. So sometimes it's overdone. John kabat I think, is spot on. Maybe not all of his followers. Or, and he's not responsible for the whole mindfulness m movement. But we're coming back to the Buddhist tradition here. You are maintaining mindfulness, recognizing with discerning intelligence the tendencies of your physical behavior, the tendencies of your speech, the tendencies of your mind, and you're recognizing with intelligence this is wholesome, this is unwholesome, beneficial, not beneficial, and so forth. And mindfulness, and then he continues, so it's discerning. There's no reference here whatsoever to be non-judgmental. Any more than there is, don't be nasty, don't be, an, don't be a jerk, don't be selfish. I mean, there's a lot of things not to be, but that's not the definition of mindfulness. This is the definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness, when it arises, follows the courses of beneficial and unbeneficial tendencies. Follows the courses of means you've just said something. Now watch what are the repercussions. You've just put somebody down. Don't be such a klutz like that. I was pointing to nobody. Don't be such a klutz. How does that turn out? When you just told somebody, don't be a klutz. I don't know what you say in, in, in Australia, but we get klutz, right? Okay. Don't be a klutz. How does that turn out? Does the person, say, does the person smile and say, thank you for the advice, I'll try not to be a klutz? <laughs> Probably not. You just abuse them, you show your condescension, you show your arrogance, you're showing them to be very judgmental. So maybe that wasn't beneficial, maybe that didn't turn out like you wanted. You know? So just in your speech, your behavior, and then the desires, the emotions, the thoughts come to mind when you embrace them, identify them, and run with them. How does it turn out? And you know whether it's beneficial non, but not beneficial, not because the Buddha said so, but because you see, as the consequences flow out, this turned out to be unbeneficial, not conducive to my own or anybody else's well-being. Whereas this, this act of kindness, of thought, thoughtfulness, of sensitivity, of empathy, that turned out very well, actually. The other person was pleased. I felt a warmth in my heart. I think that was eudaimonia. The other person, we have a very harmonious relationship. That turned out well. I think I'll do that again. Not because I have to, but I like to be living in harmony. I like to have harmonious relationships with other people. So following the course of, as you witness the type of activities of body, speech, and mind you engage in, you will determine that they're beneficial or not beneficial based on impact, influence, consequences. Very helpful, very pragmatic. This is how he's defining mindfulness. Recognizing these tendencies are beneficial, these unbeneficial, these tendencies are helpful, these unhelpful. So it's discerning, it's intelligent, it's loving, it's warm, but it's intelligent and not judgmental. It's not designed to beat you up, it's designed to heal you and to see the way you engage with yourself and everywhere around you is harmonious and beneficial. Thus, one who practices yoga, yoga, coming into union with your ground, it's spiritual practice, it's not an asana. One who practices yoga rejects unbeneficial tendencies and cultivates beneficial tendencies. Now that's a Buddhist definition. That's a Buddhist definition. This is gold standard, that's an arhat. He's considered a, you know, right up there with the Buddha in the whole Theravada tradition. And so there it is, this is a gold standard. Now the greatest commentator in the whole and the systematizer of Theravada Buddhism is Buddha Gosa, living in the fifth century of the common era. Nagasena, I think maybe second century, I believe, a long time ago, before Buddha Gosa for sure. So Buddha Gosa, I've mentioned it before, he's now giving, he's a great scholar, formidable scholar. And so he's gonna give some real precision here, technical precision to his definition, utterly rooted in the Buddha's words, but he's gonna draw on the the last 1,000 years of Buddhism, because he's writing 1,000 years after the Buddha. So based on that tr tremendous tradition of people practicing the Buddha's teaching for 1,000 years and drawing on that, he's going to define mindfulness in a very sophisticated and kind of professional way. By means of mindfulness, they, that is, other mental processes, mindfulness operates in conjunction with other mental factors, 
emotions, feelings, desires, and so forth and so on, it, mindfulness remembers, they together with these mental processes, remember, or it itself, mindfulness, it remembers, or it is simply just remembering, thus it is mindfulness. So we know he's exactly in tune with what the Buddha said, is above all is recollection. The Pali, the Sanskrit, the Tibetan, the Mongolian, the Japanese and the Chinese terms all for mindfulness, for sati, they all mean recollection. And I'm sure the list would go on Korean and Cambodian and so forth and so on. They all mean recollection. That's the Buddhist meaning, core meaning of mindfulness, is recollection. So he says, that thus it is mindfulness. It's characteristic, the characteristic. Now he's being, he's very, he, he's like a surgeon. He's going to use the words very carefully so you have a crystal clear, precise understanding of exactly what is mindfulness and how is it different from other mental factors. Its characteristic is not floating. I know what that means, actually. Not floating is... Oh, what is your name? Ben? Okay. I'm going to engage with Ben. You're right front row, so you get to be my test subject. I'm going to engage with Ben, not floating. Right now, you can see. You can probably tell by my gaze, I'm giving you my full attention. I'm really with you. I'm, I'm your facial expression, your lips, your mouth, your eyes. We're really engaged, right? We're really connecting with each other. Now, you want to watch something here? <laughs> That's floating. <laughs> I've landed on the aircraft carrier of Ben as a helicopter, and then I just... You're no longer really engaged. I didn't wander this way or that way. You didn't see my head turning or my eyes turning. It just, I started floating. And that's the loss of clarity. It's the loss of clarity. When I'm engaging like this, that's spot on. It's relaxed, stable, clear. I'm seeing you as I'm giving you my full attention. That's not floating. But that other, you're, you're drifting, you're floating. That's floating. It is laxity and dullness. But it's a nice, it's a nice imagery of floating, isn't it? So its character is not floating. Its property is not losing. Not losing means forgetting. Forgetting. My eyes just turn elsewhere. My attention turns elsewhere. I don't start looking at you or you or anybody else. That's losing. Losing is forgetting. Its manifestation is guarding or the state of being face to face with an object. Fully engaged, face to face, as Ben and I were face to face, fully engaged with each other. That's its nature. Bearing in mind. Its, strong, its basis is strong noting, that is, attending with interest, with discernment, with clarity, or, if you apply this, the close application of mindfulness of the body, and so on. Those are the applications of mindfulness. Closely minding, or being mindful of the body, and, and so forth. And should, it should be seen as like a post due to its state of being set in the object. So I'm just locking on, the post, like you plant a post in the ground, I'm planting my, I'm, I'm planting, I'm, oh, gotcha. I'm, I'm fixing my attention on you, like planting a stake. And as like, and being like a gatekeeper because it guards the gate of the eye and so on. So in other words, it's giving full attention to whatever you may be attending to. So that's mindfulness. Now let's go on to introspection. And again, this term, <coughs> I translated it as introspection. I've had about 40 years to think about it. In other translations, the common one in the Theravada tradition, it's Sampajanya in Pali, Sambrajanya in Sanskrit, often translated as clear comprehension, as alertness, vigilance, and awareness, or full awareness. That's what I've seen. I find all of those way too vague. It's also translated as vigilance. I find it way too vague. Um, clear comprehension. Each one has a reason behind it, but they're all too vague because this Sampajanya is always reflexive. You can be mindful of anything you like. Any, you shoot a target, you can be mindful of it. But introspection, by definition, is always reflexive. I cannot be practicing introspection with respect to your posture. I can't do that. I can be mindful of it. But introspection is always expecting intro. It's reflexive. So right now, am I aware of the movements of my hands? Yeah, introspectively, they're my hands. So I'm reflexing, reflexively aware of the movements of my hand. Is it appropriate, inappropriate, and so forth? I'm aware of my speech. Sometimes get a bit too fast. Maybe slow down a little bit. I'm reflexively aware of what I'm saying, how I'm saying, tone of voice. Is it helpful? Is it constructive? That's expecting intro on my speech. When it comes to shamatha, you're expecting intro, monitoring the flow of mindfulness. Am I slipping into laxity or excitation? 
that specking intro. So none of the others, and I gave pretty much every list, I've you know, been reading translations for a long time, they're just too big. But specking intro is exactly what this is, it's reflexive on one's own body, speech, and mind, in meditation, especially the mind. But introspectively, you'll be checking up in the breathing to see that it's not becoming constrained or restricted or forced. Introspectively, you'll be checking your posture, whether you're starting to slip over like that. I, I saw one person starting out like that, and then I don't think that's a good idea for hour after hour. You strain your back of your neck. So you should notice things like that, you know, that you're checking up like a parent checking up on the children, playing, make sure they're not getting mischief or licking the wall, the paint from the wall, things like that. Kids like to try anything. And so that's what introspection is, and that's why I translated introspection and not any of the other options. I think they're too big. But now the Buddha, did, the Buddha will tell us exactly what he means. Herein, a monk should constantly review his own mind thus. So he's emphasizing that which needs to be emphasized, primarily spect intro on your mind, because that's the root of everything you say, and that's the root of everything you do voluntarily with your body. So reviews his mind thus, does any excitation concerning these five cores of sensual pleasure ever arise in me on any occasion? So does, does excitation occur towards mm, the visual, the auditory, the tactile, and so forth? Do you get agitated, excited? If, on reviewing his, his mind, the monk understands excitation concerning these five cords of sensual pleasure does arise in me on certain occasion, then he understands desire and lust for the five cords of sensual pleasure are not abandoned in me. I'm not over it yet, so I've got work to do. But you know that by expecting intro. In this way, he has introspection of that. That's how you exercise and refine your faculty of introspection. But if, on reviewing his mind, the monk understands no excitation concerning these five cores of sensual pleasure arises in me on any occasion, then he understands desire and lust for the five cores of sensual pleasure are abandoned in me. In this way, he has introspection of that. So it's that. He just gave one example. But this also goes for ill will, for example. There's ill will, malice, malevolence, enmity. Does that ever arise in my mind stream on any occasion? Encountering anyone, anything, any situation in the present or the past, does it ever arise, the wish that others may not find happiness? Malevolence, now enmity. If so, then you're not free of it. It's, a, it's like still having tuberculosis. It may not be always active, but, or malaria. If you ever have a bout of malaria, you still have it, right? Even if it's not showing up all the time. And likewise, for laxity and dullness, excitation and anxiety, afflictive, I've just given the five obscurations. If they ever arise on any occasion, you're not free of them yet. If they never arise on any occasion, good, then you're on the way to freedom. So that's introspection. He says it himself. Now we go back, and this is both, again, Pali Canon, Pali Canon, Theravada tradition. Let's just hop right over to Mahayana, see if there's any real difference. There could be. And so Asanga, we're back to the 5th century, Asanga, Nagarjuna, big pillar of Indian Mahayana Buddhism, regarded as extraordinary authority by all Tibetan Buddhist schools. He says in another of his classic texts, the Abhidhamma Samuchaya, mindfulness and introspection are taught for the first, that is mindfulness, prevents the attention from straying from the meditative object. And I'll say, why? Because you're bearing it in mind. You're recalling it. You're not forgetting it. So the first prevents the attention from straying from your chosen object, while the second, introspection, recognize, recognizes that the attention is straying. So we call it intro introspection, but we can also call it metacognition, as a term psychologists use more frequently. But it's not quite big enough. It's a great term, really useful, very helpful, metacognition. The awareness of being aware, the awareness of what's taking place in the mind. But that doesn't cover the whole, the entirety, of what the Buddhists mean by introspection. Descartes' definition of introspection, again, specting intro on the mind, very good, very useful, but it's not the same as a Buddhist because I introspectively monitor my physical behavior, introspectively monitor my posture, introspectively monitor my speech and my breath, and then going inner, inner to the mind, and I introspectively monitor the mind, the flow of mindfulness and so forth. So it's bigger. It's not just metacognition. It's reflexive awareness of body, speech, and mind. And so, 
if you say, and what is mindfulness? The non-forgetfulness of the mind with respect to a familiar object having the function of non-distraction. So, if you're bearing something in mind, you don't forget it. If you're bearing something in mind, you don't become distracted away from it. That's mindfulness. So this is, again, it's gold standard. This is a, as authoritative as you can get for the whole of Indian Mahayana tradition. Shantideva, another tremendous authority, one of the greatest bodhisattvas in the whole Indian Buddhist tradition, in his classic text, A Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, or Bodhicharya Vatara, he says at the end of his fifth chapter, which is all about introspection, it's a brilliant chapter. Uh, in brief, this alone is the definition of introspection, the repeated examination of the state of one's body and mind. That's why you can't say metacognition, which is mind. When you say body and mind, of course, your speech is right there at the juncture between body and mind. You can't speak without using your mouth, but you can't speak without using your mind. So it's the bridge between the two, isn't it? So that's covered implicitly. Got 10 minutes, let's continue a little bit more. Posture, especially, well, yeah, in Zen tradition, postures can be really strongly emphasized. I've never been trained in Zen. I've taught at Zen, Zen centers never received any training in Zen. But I've heard that if you're in a really strict Zendo, uh, they'll be, the, the, the Roshi will be, very, he'll maybe walking up and down the line, the aisles, and watching your posture. And if your posture looks a little bit like this, you have this stick, and that you're right here in the soft part, and you'll be sitting there feeling you're meditating, and suddenly, wow, that hurt. Yes, you woke me up, thanks a million because he'll whack you. Because he wants to see every single one something like that. Posture, really important. Theravada, fairly important. Tibetan Buddhism, oh my goodness. Seven points of the Vairochana posture. Seven points, and that includes sitting full lotus. Knock yourself out. Watch the little cartilage in your knees go. <laughs> <laughs> one friend of mine did a lot of Full Lotus, and he told me after a while, well, I had a choice to either jog or meditate. Because <laughs> do that a lot. You can kiss your jogging days goodbye. Unless you started doing it when you were 10 years old. Then it's cool. Tibetans didn't sit on chairs. When they're sitting, they're sitting cross-legged. And that was true for most of Asia. Chairs are Western, American, what, you know, European deal. So if you're, if you're just growing up sitting cross-legged, because that's how you eat and, you know, doing anything else, then no problem. Then you just go flip, flip, bend your legs to full lotus. Cool. But if you like me, you started when you were 20, then there may be some real, how do you say, stress there. So it's good. It's good to know what the ideal is. And I won't go through all the seven points of Orochana, but if you get a really gnarly, tough-minded, Marine Corps drill sergeant kind of teacher, you might say, if you're not doing the seven point Orochana posture, I can't take you seriously. Uh, maybe that's just a bit too intense. Um, because what I've been reading, especially over the last 30 years, is when you sit down to meditate, meditate on a comfortable cushion. But if you're sitting there in full lotus, and your knees are screaming at you, and your butt's screaming at you, and your hips are screaming at you, and then you sit for 20 minutes, and your back is screaming at you, a chorus of bodily screams, would you please stop doing this? then there's no way you can be sitting on a comfortable cushion because you're not comfortable. The cushion never gets comfortable, it's a cushion. <laughs> so you're sitting on a comfortable cushion if and only if when you're sitting on it, you're comfortable. And if you're not comfortable in the seven point La Roche in a posture, then you're not following the instructions. And so Gyatrimbachi, my primary lama for Dzogchen, he was just so wise, is so wise, he's still alive. But when he said, yes, this is optimal. If you can sit comfortably in the seven point Vairochana posture, om, like that, full lotus, and you can sit like that for the same period, great, that's, that's best, that's best. But if you can't, if you're uncomfortable or you're damaging your spine or your ankles or your knees or your hips, then give it a rest and just find a posture that's comfortable. So that's very helpful. And so for a long time, decades now, I have a bit of an unusual body in some ways that makes it uncomfortable sitting really straight for a long period of time. And so then I decided, well, I can either meditate less or I can just be more flexible in posture. And about 15 years ago, I went into a very intense six-month retreat, total solitude. 
And before I went in, Yatru Rinpoche told me, Alan, when you're in retreat now, and he guided me in that retreat, he said, make sure you make use of the supine position. Make sure you do. And he's not a California hippie. He's a very traditional, marvelous Tibetan Lama. And so I'm known, I think, by a number of people as Alan Wallace. Oh, yeah, he's the guy that says you can lie down when you meditate. And he's from California. What did you expect? You know, <laughs> California, they're softies. You know, they're not like the Germans. <laughs> they can handle it. You know, they're tough. Maybe even the Aussies. But California, give me a break. They're not even New Yorkers. New Yorkers might be able to handle it. But Cal uh, they, what, a, what a wuss. Well, it's not actually me. It's let's say who it is. It's an arhat. Oh, it's an arhat. That's cool. An arhat, Ubatisa, first century of the Common Era, he writes in another classic, the Vimuti Maga, that preceded the Visuddhi Maga, Path of Purification, he says, as an arhat, the standing and walking postures are particularly suitable for lustful natured personalities, while sitting and reclining are more appropriate for anger natured personalities. <laughs> now, he's speaking specifically of Vipassana more than Shamatha. Because the Buddha himself said in his classic definitive presentation of Vipassana called the Satipatthana Sutta, the Discourse on the Four Applications of Mindfulness, that practice while sitting, lying down, walking, and standing. That's, that's the Buddha's injunction. He didn't say, if you're not sitting in the seven-point Varochana posture, you're wasting my time, why don't you piss off? He didn't say that. So he said all four postures are appropriate, useful. And so, then among the four postures, if one is more of the attachment, lust, craving kind of person, then, especially for Vipassana, you might want to emphasize standing and walking. But if one is more ill-tempered, irascible, irritable, you guess it, Miss Piggy, more anger-natured, then sitting and reclining are better for you. Now, when it comes to shamatha, shamatha, where you're really withdrawing your awareness from the environment and really going into deeper, deeper samadhi, where in fact the environment will fade out. As you go into very deep samadhi, you'll be oblivious of your environment and even of your own body. If you're doing that, then it's not a really great idea to practice shamatha while you're walking, because you'll just bump into something. Okay. Or if you're walking, it, or even standing, you may just fall over, because you become so disengaged with your muscles, you may just collapse. So that's not so good. Vipassana is fine, but sh for shamatha, probably alternating between sitting and reclining, sitting and reclining. Sitting can be in a, in a very comfortable chair, or a chair like you have is okay, a chair like this, quite good. Or sitting cross-legged, that's fine, but the lying down is an option, and that's from an arhat, who is not from California. So there it is, we have that authorization. And then we go back to Buddhaghosa. There it is, you know Buddhaghosa, fifth century of the Common Era, and so in his classic text, he says, okay, now for postures. Walking suits one. Standing or sitting or lying down suits another. So he should try them. Like the abode, like the place you're meditating, try out different places. For three days each. Again, he's talking about the passion explicitly, but implicitly. Standing, sitting or lying down would be perfectly good for shamatha. So check out where's the best place for you to meditate and give it three-day trial. And that posture is suitable in which his unconcentrated mind becomes concentrated or his concentrated mind becomes more so. Any other should be understood as unsuitable. So if you just can't sit comfortably, some people can't. It's scoliosis, it's injury, it's getting old, it's cartilage dissolving in the spine and so forth. If you just can't sit comfortably, either on a chair or, or cross-legged, then don't worry. Find supine. If supine is no good, find some kind of chair that can accommodate the uh, anomalies of your body. Keep your spine straight. That's kind of important. But besides that, be comfortable. And that's what Buddha Ghost is telling us. That posture in which you find you really can concentrate your mind, develop samadhi, go for that one. And don't get too rigid. Gyatra Namurcha was so wonderfully charitable and kind in this regard. He said, if you can't do it, you know, seven points, don't worry about it. Just find something comfortable. And so, that's it for posture. That I invite people everywhere I go, if you cannot be comfortable for 24 minutes sitting either in a chair or cross-legged, in most places we have more <coughs> empty floor space than this. I say, you're always welcome. And I'll say this now, we have some floor space. You're always welcome when I'm leading the retreats. you're always welcome to go in the supine position 
on a mat, nice comfortable pillow for your head. Um, it's fine, you always have, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. And that's not something I dreamed up myself. That's from my primary Dzogchen Lama, and he's relying upon a whole tradition behind him, and here going back to an Arhat and the greatest commentator in the Theravada tradition. So that's that. That's that. Tomorrow we will go into the third of four methods of mindfulness of breathing. But I think that's enough for now. So again, to remind you, I will now vanish, and the young Jin will come back at 3.20, 20 minutes from now. And I think we decided also for her session also 90 minutes is probably enough. Because that gives half an hour more or less for the meditation, half an hour for some some reflection she'd like to share. She and I discussed this over lunch, so we're very much in cahoots here and working together. Um, I thought very good what she wanted to share, and then time for discussion. So you'll be ending then today at 4.50, quite punctually. So those have a long drive, and hopefully I would really like you to test yourself, because I really love for you not to be exhausted and just drained by the end of the day. But as they say, for the final point, do I have? Yeah, I have. Okay, I'm going to give myself 60 seconds. Medita meditation advice from the first person, Geshe Ngon Taigi, who taught me shamatha. He said, he said, when it comes to short, how have your sessions be short, 15 minutes, 24 minutes? He said, what's short? Well, short is what's short for you. What's short for that woman who was meditating 11 hours at a stretch was nine hours, right, or 10. But for you, if you find, when you're on your own, if you find 24 minutes just drags on, you're wondering when is it, when is that chime gonna ring? It's too long. So cut it back, cut it back to 20. If 20 still feels long, cut it back to 15. That's what Genlam Rimba, a yogi's yogi, suggested. If it's 15, it's fi let it be 15. But the idea is, and this is going back to my beloved and revered teacher, Gishin Wantaige, he said, when you come to the end of the session, end it when you still could do more, not when you're just drained to the last drop. But you could easily do a bit more. And so as for meditation, and then you, you, you end the session with a session, boy, I'd like to do a bit more, but I'll take a break now. It's like a guest coming into your house, and they leave before you really wanted them to. <laughs> and they don't keep on staying and said, wow. <laughs> you know, they don't overstay their welcome, because then you, they will not get invited back. So if they leave before you really want them to leave, you probably want to invite them back again. Come to the end of meditation, end when you still have some gas in your tank. And for us too, hopefully at 4.50, you'll still have a bit of gas in your tank. She said, but she could have gone a little bit longer, couldn't she? Not today. Enjoy your afternoon. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 9.